In the early 1970s, American automobile companies were taking note that European import brands were making significant headway into the U.S. marketplace and began devising plans to try to stem the market share losses to these competitors. While the domestics often had vehicles that functioned specifically as sports cars and a whole other set of vehicles that functioned specifically as luxury cars, American automobile executives noticed that Europeans tended to blend traits of both sports and luxury cars together in one overall package, and it was proving highly successful. And within General Motors, a couple different divisions particularly took note of this trend, one of which was Oldsmobile, who introduced in 1973 the Cutlass Salon that was designed to compete against some of these German automakers. But another division that noticed this within GM was Pontiac. And as a result, Pontiac launched in 1973, would later become one of the most storied and successful nameplates in Pontiac history, the Grand Am. Pontiac had once before combined the names of a couple models into one to signify a new overall model designation. Such was the case of the Pontiac Granville that was introduced in 1971 that took part of the name from Grand Prix and part of the name from Bonneville to form the Granville. The hope was that the car would, from a marketing standpoint at least, exemplify traits of both and combine them into one vehicle. Pontiac apparently thought it was appropriate to try the same trick on the Grand Am, again using the Grand Prix name for half of the Grand Am's nomenclature, and the other half coming from, you guessed it, the Trans Am, hence the Grand Am. The Grand Am was launched in the fall of 1972 as a 1973 model, and it was built upon GM's intermediate A-body platform that was shared with other vehicles, including the Chevrolet Chevelle, the Oldsmobile Cutlass, and the Buick Regal and Century. All of these vehicles and the A-platform sibling mates were all new for 1973, And one of the major items associated with this redesign was the elimination of hardtops from the overall lineup in favor of what was then called the so-called colonnade styling. The thought behind this decision was GM Engineering's belief that impending Federal Motor Vehicle safety standards for rollover were not going to be able to be met by standard hardtop body styles. Thus, these were gradually eliminated from GM as well as other automakers' lineups, and convertibles were even eliminated. Recall that in 1976, Cadillac made a big deal out of selling what it said was the last convertible, only for it to return a few years later in the early 1980s. However, it was due to these thought-to-be impending rollover standards that the coupes got fixed rear windows, ahead of which was a rather substantial B-pillar, And the sedans also got a rather substantial B-pillar in the middle of the car, giving the car the overall colonnade look, as it was called, similar to the architectural term. Of Pontiac's intermediate colonnade cars, which included the Le Mans, the GTO, and the Grand Am, the Grand Am was meant to be kind of the luxury sport cruiser, with good performance, ride and handling, and comfort all combined into one. In one of the Pontiac brochures from 1973, the Grand Am is described as a car that's a luxury car, a personal car, a performance car, and an innovative car. Hence, Grand Am is destined to intrigue people for varied causes. One reaction we're confident we won't encounter is indifference. The Grand Am could be had in both two- and four-door form, although the two-door was far more popular with 34,400 units sold in 1973 compared to 8,700 of the four-door. The Grand Am also featured some unique styling elements, including the plastic Endura bumper-style rubber canoe front end that was unique to the car. Styling otherwise borrowed heavily from the Le Mans, including the unique dual torpedo-shaped side surfacing of the vehicle. Inside, buyers were treated to individually adjustable bucket seats, something that was quite rare for the time in American cars. Another rarity was that the dashboard was made of actual wood. In this case, genuine African crossfire mahogany wood inlay was employed for the dash on the Grand Dams. It was tasteful, handsome, and was well complemented by a sports three-spoke style steering wheel. 
Under hood, the Grand Am came standard with a 400 cubic inch V8 and a two barrel carburetor making 170 horsepower. There was an optional 400 cubic inch four barrel V8 making 200 horsepower when outfitted with single exhaust and 230 horsepower when outfitted with dual exhaust. Buyers could also select from an optional 455 cubic inch V8. And although the brochure states that the 455 cubic inch Super Duty engine was available in the Grand Am, to my knowledge, it was never offered and was reserved specifically for the Firebirds, where, just for reference, it did make 310 horsepower, quite powerful for this smog era. In terms of base price, Pontiac was quite ambitious with the Grand Am's pricing, with base prices starting around $4,300 for the coupe and sedan. This was about $1,000 more expensive than the top-of-the-line luxury Le Mans of the era, which was a rather nice intermediate car. And it was also slightly above the price of the Bonneville, albeit not quite the price of the $4,600 to $4,700 Granville. However, despite its lofty base price, the Grand Am was reasonably successful in its first year that it went on sale, selling about 43,000 units. In 1974, the Grand Am sales would slow to about 16,000 units, and the nameplate was dropped after 1975 when sales totaled just about 10,000 units. The Grand Am would be revived again for the 1978 model year through 1980 model year before it would die yet again, only to be revived again in 1985. And while the 1973-75 to 75 Grand Am wasn't entirely a sales success, it did feature a lot of unique content for the era, some of which I previously mentioned, including the individually adjustable bucket seats and the African mahogany instrument panel. It also was one of the first U.S.-built cars to feature a turn signal-mounted headlamp dimmer that was often placed on the floor in domestic vehicles, including on the lower-level Le Mans car in which the Grand Am was based. Interestingly, the Cutlass Salon for Oles also had this headlamp dimmer placed on the turn signal stock. Grand Ams also came standard with full instrumentation, which Pontiac deemed the Rally Gauge Cluster, and a huge 1.1-inch front stabilizer bar to help the car handle better than the standard Le Mans. However, despite the quote-unquote radio-tuned suspension, stiffer springs and shocks and large stabilizer bars, Grand Am was still endowed with a rather compliant ride for the era, and it was comfortable on long trips, not only because the suspension was well-tuned, but also because the bucket seats had another rarity for the time, individually adjustable lumbar supports. If you're lucky enough to find one, a 1973 Grand Am would be a great choice for a classic, albeit they're quite expensive now. The car's balance between ride, handling, and comfort is just superb. Very similar to the old Cutlass Salon. And if you're lucky enough to find a Grand Am, it's a car that can be used as a great weekend long trip cruiser or to throw around the twisties, which sounds strange to say about such a large car. But these cars actually do handle shockingly well. About the only downside of these cars are the somewhat sloppy workmanship the relatively small trunk for such a large car, which was true of the other A bodies as well, and on the coupes, the almost impossible to clean rear window with the gills. Very, very hard to get in there and clean the dirt out. That said, the Grand Am is certainly a unique car from an era in automotive history where some would argue there weren't too many exciting vehicles. I would beg to differ. But this is certainly an exciting one, and one that if you're able to find one at a good price, I would highly recommend picking up. Thanks again for watching this video on the 1973 Pontiac Grand Am. Until next time, take care and check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you. Also, please stay tuned for an interview series with John Manugian where he talks about his involvement in the later Grand Am, the 1992 Grand Am, which was an undoubted sales success for the company.